What's up guys, this is Corey, Programming at Home 2020 Quarantine Edition. Today we're talking about functional programming, partial application, and monads. Let's get it. All right guys, so before we can talk about monads or partial application, we need to talk about lies. And the first line I'm going to show you here today, we're going to be working with uh, two functions, an encryption function and a decryption function in PHP. Uh, we'll be using the OpenSSL library to do these. So let's just take a quick peek at those. Here we have encrypt SSL, which takes a plain text, a password, and returns a ciphertext. Okay? That ciphertext is going to be a base64 encoded message and an initialization vector. That initialization vector is like a salt. It's what makes each encrypted message unique, even if you're encrypting the exact same message, because that initialization vector is different. So we have an encryption function, and we have a decryption function. The decryption function takes an encrypted message and a password. It splits it up into the two pieces. It base64 decodes them and then pass them to the OpenSSL decrypt function. So here, our decrypt function takes a cipher string and a password, and it returns a string. But it doesn't, because if we pass in, well, I shouldn't say that. It sometimes returns a string. For some ciphers, it returns a string. But for other ciphers, it returns false. Why is that? If you pass in an invalid cipher, I can't give you back a string. So in PHP style, we return false. Well, that means that this type signature is a lie. Decrypt SSL doesn't always decrypt data. It usually decrypts data if you, for most, well, I shouldn't say for most, for some ciphers and passwords, it will send you back plain text. But for others, you just get back false. This is not very, this is not very useful. So that's the lie that we're trying to fix. And in the meantime, we'd like to clean it up. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take this method right here, which has two conditionals, right? An explode method, then we're converting the type of an initial string into an array of pieces. We're making sure we have two pieces, then we're base64 decoding those pieces. Then we're making sure that the base64 decode worked. Then we're passing that to OpenSSL decrypt. Okay, then we're returning possibly the result on this line. All right, so if we look at the OpenSSL decrypt, this is a little bit ugly. It takes a message, then we have this hard coded string here. This is the advanced encryption standard 128 bit cipher block chaining mode encryption. And then we have this, then it takes the password, and then it takes this additional mode parameter which says what types message and IV are. And then it takes an IV. But this stuff right here is hard code. We don't really care about this, right? So let's make a new method here. We're going to call our new function. We're going to call it raw decrypt. And that takes just a cipher, just an initialization vector, and just a password, and calls OpenSL decrypt on it for us. This is a much better type signature, OK? This is a little, going to be a little bit easier for us to work with. And as you get into functional programming, having good, clean type signatures like that becomes really important, as we'll find out here in just a minute. So what we're going to do is take this piece of code, this kind of ugly code, and we're going to turn it into this less ugly piece of code, which is much more readable. Here we can see we're taking, I'll, I'll get to the partial application in just a second. That's, I want to get in, I want to deep dive into that. But right now I want to show you this box. What we're doing is we're wrapping our cipher string in this box and we're letting the box handle all of our error conditions for us. And we're just telling the box what operations we want to perform. So we say, hey, we want to explode the cipher. Then we want to base64 decode the cipher. Then we want to test if the result of that has a count of two, right? If we have two elements. And then we want to decrypt it, right? And each one of these methods, you say, oh, there's four different methods being chained together here. Um, that's the entire type signature of the box, right? 
most boxes you just do then, 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 then. It looks like a JavaScript promise, right? You have a box, then do this, then do this, then do this. Then is basically performing an operation on the contents of the box and making sure that whatever the result of that is, whatever the return value is, is still valid. All right? So let's say we have a box of a string and you're performing some operations on that string. The then method is going to ensure that the operation of each one of those transforms is still a string. And if any portion of those operations fail, then the entire chain fails. Okay? So what that what does that do? That allows you to just write your logic and have all the boilerplate conditionals pulled out. It's so much cleaner. And the important point of that is that it's much more readable. And it's much more, it's much easier to reason about your code and find bugs and find errors. It reduces corner cases because you're just piping the data through a chain of commands and all the error handling's done for you and it's handled outside. Okay. It also, we've fixed our lie, right? Our decrypt SSL always returns an FP box now. Okay, that's functional programming. This is just a little namespace we've created. It always returns a box. It doesn't sometimes return a box, sometimes not return a box. It always returns a box, and we can check that box to see if it's empty or not. Okay? So, before we can get into exactly how this works, we need to talk about, we have a couple problems here before we can do this, right? We want to explode on that dot character, but the explode function takes two parameters, the element to explode on and the string to explode. But what we want to do is we want to just call single functions and say, do this operation on the data. Do this operation, right? The name of the operation, the function to call. We don't want to have to say, do this operation and this operation has these parameters, right? We want that outside. So in order to do that, we're going to use partial application. What partial application does is it glues arguments to functions in place so that we would get, have a new function that always has that particular argument applied at that location. All right. So here we have, we're making a partial application on the explode function. And basically this line is setting the first parameter to the explode function to always be the dot. So now we have a new function here called exploder that is the calling explode with the first parameter is dot on whatever our data is. So we can say, let's do this. Let's print our exploder cipher, All right? Just so you can see exactly how this works. I'm gonna just go ahead and return. And let's go down here to our test scratch. And let's say, we're gonna say better decrypt SSL, okay. So let's just run that. Oh, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, return, loading test file. And it looks like we have a syntax error somewhere. Nice. Loading test file, scratch. Test scratch, let's do echo foobar. test what's our error a function with return type must return a value oh well let's return foo so tiny test is a test framework that I've created because PHP units a little bit too slow um, I'm uh, the main function that I do with PHP is we have a PHP firewall called bitfire bitfire um, well, we'll do other videos about Bitfire, but whenever we have, whenever we run our test suite, we run tens of thousands of attacks against the firewall as part of our unit test suite, and PHP unit was just much too slow. So we're using tiny test here as our test runner. And we can see that, yes, we didn't return a box. Yes, I realize that. Yes. Um, so, but that's not what's important. What's important is that we're printing this value right here. So we can see that the exploder on Cypher Right, so let's do, let's uh, um, echo cipher. So 
So if we look at the cipher, and we're going to just, we're not going to worry about this error for right now. This is our cipher text right here. And by calling exploder, we get our output just like we wanted it split right here on this dot character. Okay. So now we have a new function which only takes the input, which is the data we want to explode on. Okay. Now for decryption, we want to lock in that password string, right? So here we're going to lock in the password, but this time we use partial write. And partial write locks in the rightmost parameter. Let's take a look at how these functions work. They're quite small. This is the entire partial application feature right here. So what it does is it takes a callable, which is a function, right? So in this case, let's 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 look at this one. We'll look at partial write. Raw decrypt, that's the callable function. And then arguments to lock in. In this case, the password. Okay. So what this spread operator does is it says takes any number of arguments that we pass in and convert it into an array called args. So args is an array. Now we create a new closure. Okay. In closure, we're going to capture that function and we're going to capture those arguments. That means that inside this scope right here, function and arguments will always be available inside this function as whatever those values are. Okay. This scope sort of permanently has that function and arguments glued into it. Plus, we're able to take in new parameters. So let's break this down. Function is raw decrypt, that's our method to call. Arguments is the password. And now uh, let's make it, let's just say dollar decrypt uh, and we'll call it with, um, let's see, uh, cipher, and we'll call it message, message in dollar ID, right? So now when we call this code right here, message and IV are going to be an array of X. X is going to be an array of the values message and IV. Okay. So inside this block right here, we have args, which is an array of the password, and we have X, which is an array of the message and the IV. Now we merge them together with the new parameters first. So that means message and IV will be first and let's look at our type signature here for raw decrypt message and IV is first and then args which is the password is next right that's last args is that password which is the third parameter so what we're getting back is a new function that's going to call raw decrypt with password always filled in to whatever this password is okay so now decrypt is a new decryption function that takes just a message and just an IV and will always decrypt it with that password. So partial left or the original partial function is the exact same thing but if you look the order of the arguments is reversed. Here the function calls arguments are passed in first and here the function call arguments are passed in second. So partial locks in the beginning parameters partial right locks in the end parameters. So we've created our two functions here. Now let's look at how we can use those and chain them together inside of our box. So we're going to create a new box of the cipher message, which is the string, right? That's the string separated by the dot. It's a single string with a dot in the two parts. Then we run our exploder with that dot. So now the contents of the box here on this line is that original message. Now the contents of the box is an array with the two pieces. We then call the map function, which will call this function, base64 decode, on each element of the box. So we're now we're gonna base we're gonna base64 decode each element. Then we're gonna do a conditional to test if our values are still good. So now we're going to do a conditional. We pass in a, it's a, not really closure, but it's an anonymous function, which has the value of our box is passed in as x. And we say, hey, if the count of x is 2, then we know we have a message and an initialization vector. Let's keep it. If this 
doesn't pass, right? If x is null or empty, or x is an array of one element, or an array of three elements, or an object, this condition will pass and the box essentially empties itself, okay? So then when we execute the next function, then spread, then spread is going to call our function, then spread, but it's gonna take the value of the box and perform the spread operation on it. So that means we have two functions or two elements in our array. We're basically going to, instead of passing an array to the decrypt function, we wanna pass each element as a parameter to that function. Does that make sense? And now what we have at the end of that is a new box with all of these operations applied to it. The splitting of the message, the base64 decoding, confirming that we have two pieces, and decrypting the message. And it's all done, essentially, in a one-liner. And all the logic to handle error conditions is now lifted out. Our type signature is now not a lie because it always returns a box. And we can test the value of the box to see if it's empty or not. Um, so it, it, this really, programming in this style will really change the way you write code. Um, it makes your code a lot easier to reason about. Looking at this code, anyone can look at this and see, once, you've, once you're a little bit familiar with the tool chest, you can see that the operations we're performing here is we're creating a box of our cipher, we're exploding on it, then we're base64 decoding on it, we're making sure we got two things, and then we're passing those two things to the decryption function. So if you look at our original function, that's not nearly as obvious when you first look at this. You sort of have to break this piece apart and say, okay, now I'm exploding on the dot, now what am I doing? How many pieces is this thing expecting? Well, it looks like it's expecting two. Well, now it's gonna do something if it's not two, apparently. Now it's gonna return false. Okay, so maybe I'm gonna get here. Now it's base64 decoding those pieces and then it's passing those to temporary variables. Do I need those or not? I, I don't know. Now it's testing those to see if we have something and I guess they both have to be not false. So they don't have to be true, but they're, they can be anything that's not false. So they could be null, they could be an array, um, they could be numbers, they could be strings. I'm not really sure what these are. Or at least I'm not sure by this test here what these things are. And then I'm calling this OpenSSL decrypt function and now I gotta sort of know the type signature for this. And then apparently I'm gonna return false. Oh no, I'm gonna return the decrypt. If the message and the IV aren't false, then I return that. Otherwise, I return false. So you can get through it, but it takes a minute. It takes a you know a minute to read through all that. And then when you're looking at this, I see these conditionals, but what I don't know is, is there important logic in here? Is this just test, are these tests just testing to make sure that these worked? Well, when you read the code and you know, oh yeah, of course, that's all it's doing. But if I haven't read this code before, I don't know that, which means I have to really read this code and understand exactly what this line is doing. And then I understand, okay, they're just testing to make sure the base64 decode operation worked. And then they're running this. There's no other logic being performed there, but there could be and I don't know. So if I'm looking for a bug or trying to find where something is, I've got to go read all this. So when you look at this version, this is much more explicit. I'm exploding, base64 decoding, I should have two of these things, and then I'm decrypting. I'm just performing those operations. Let's take a look at how this works. If we look at the FP box class, we have one member variable that's a private value. It can be of any type. We have a private constructor that just takes that value and sets it. Then we have an of method that allows us to create a box of something as a static method. So we can say box of, and in this case, box of cipher. And that just sets that member variable and returns a new box. We have a then method which takes a callable. And all that does is test if we have a box of something. If we have something, it's going to call that function on the something, okay? So if the value of the box is null or it's false or it's empty or it's an empty array, 
it will not call the function. It's just going to return the box. Well, it always returns the box, but it will not mutate the value. It won't change the value of the box. Now, if you were doing real monads and real functional programming, we wouldn't use any mutation. We'd be returning a brand new box, and then you just let the garbage collector handle the old box. But because of the way I'm using the code, and because this is running in front of every web request, and I won't really care about memory, and because of the way I'm using the class, I'm not going to get into a situation where I have multiple references of this thing, and one's one value, another one's another value. I'm just using this to chain method calls together. I couldn't possibly have a reference to those other values anyway. So there's no point in creating new boxes of empty things with values that are just floating around to let the garbage collector deal with it. So in this case, we're going to actually mutate the value of the box. You could make an, I might end up making an immutable box, which doesn't do that, and it always returns a new box of a new thing rather than changing the contents of the box, but your mileage may vary. Now we call uh, the function with the value of the box. If the result of that, or if this, yeah, so then I say, I store that into a temporary variable, and then if the value of that is a new box, then I just set the va our value of our box to be the value of the box that was just returned. Okay, does that make sense? Now you could get in a situation where you call these functions and it's returning boxes and boxes and boxes and you have all these nested boxes and you could have methods that know how to unwrap all the boxes and, and monads do that. But I decided not to do that. If I have a box, I want to get rid of it, unwrap it, I just care about the value. So then I have a then spread function which works just like then, only instead of just calling the function on the value of the box, we're using the spread operator. So assuming that the value of the box is an array, we're going to use the spread operator to spread out the values of that box as function arguments to the method. Okay. Now if the value is not an array, we just use the then method. Right? So if I have just a string, and we use then spread, we're not going to create an error. We're going to call then on it and just call the function on the value of the box if the box isn't empty. Now we have the map function, which will, it's very similar to then spread, but we're going to call the function that's passed in on every element of the box. So if we have a list of things, let's say a list of numbers, we're going to call the function on each element of that number. And if the array is not a map, then we're just going to call then on it. Those are our three basic functions and our three basic core methods of uh, manipulating the contents of our box. Then we have a couple other helper methods. I have an if method, which runs a function with the value of the box. And depending on the return value of that, will either change the contents of the box to be false or empty. It will essentially empty the contents of the box, or it won't. So this way you can say, this allows you to add some sort of constraints and say, hey, the I've run these operations. Now the value of these operations must be this thing before I do these extra operations. If it's not, then we empty the box, which will prevent other methods further in the chain from executing. And we always return this, that way we can do our function chaining. And then if not is simply the opposite of if. We have a convenience method for empty, which tests if the value of the box is empty. That always returns a bool. Then we can unwrap the box by calling value, which will return the contents of the box. There's another helper method called extract, where if the value of the box is an array, and we pass in a key to that array, and we have that key in the contents of the box, it will return the value of that. This is just a nice helper method. And then we have another helper method called invoke, which is a syntactic sugar, which allows us to just call parentheses on a box and extract the value. The invoke method is a PHP magic method, which will be called if it can't resolve any method. So if I'm calling something that is not a method, what it will do is um, uh, it will send that to this invoke method. And uh, we don't care about the parameters. You can call it, you can call the name of the method wherever you want. You can pass any parameters to it you want. We don't care. We're just going to always return the value. And that's it. That's our entire 
uh, monad. This is similar to a maybe monad. I've added some extra features that I find very useful. And basically, the concept of this monad or a maybe monad is basically to wrap something and to perform operations on that something and to handle some of the error logic and error conditions of that thing being available or not available for you. This removes boilerplate code out of your software. Um, that's really all I've got for today. I hope you guys found something useful out of this. Go ahead and uh, like, actually, you know what? Before we do that, let's take a look at this just so we can see that everything's actually, actually working here. Let's run our tests just so we can actually take a look at what these things are. So here we have, uh, let's make this a little, this output a little bit bigger. So test partial, which uh, we don't need to do this anymore. Let's go ahead and kill this. And let's run our test. Let's run our test again. So here we have data one, which is our encrypted value. Let's look for, where's foobar coming from? Yeah, right there. Clear. So here, we have data one, which is our encrypted message, and data two, which is our decrypted message, and here's our values, so this is the encrypted message. Here's the output of our decrypted message. And uh, this is using the original encrypt and decrypt methods, which I showed you up here. That is this kind of ugly code. And now we want to change that to use the better decrypt. Let's see, does this piece of code actually work? So if we look at better decrypt, Let's just change our partial write to better decrypt. And what do we get? We get back a box with our initial code on it. And we can call, we can invoke it to return the value, or we can call as a method, we can call value directly on the box to return the contents of the box. We can call, if we call uh, then, Let's call then base64 encode. And now we have a base64 encoded version of that box. So this is just, just some stuff to give you some ideas. Uh, I think maybe next we might do reader monads, which is a way for you to sort of share an application context. The way I use reader monads is I have configuration data and I pass in that configuration data as a parameter to all of my methods. So if I have a, I write a pure function and uh, I have some type of configuration values on that function that gets passed in and I have a pure function that has just a normal method signature, but I wanna call it inside another application that has some sort of configuration or context and I wanna pass in those particular configuration values into some of those function parameters and I want to sort of map that configuration input into those function call values. Now this is really useful when you have a method that have maybe needs six or seven different things to call all the functions inside that method, but most of the functions don't need them. Or even the calling, the method, the function that you've, you're building doesn't need those things, but something further down the chain needs it. Reader monads become really helpful for that. So I think I may do another video about that. Go ahead and uh, like and leave a comment down below if uh, you guys found any of this stuff useful. And I'll see you guys next time. Cheers.